Hi, we're uh, presenting a session on desktop repurposing. So by way of introduction, I'm Matt Evans. I've been with VMware for just over two and a half years now. Prior to that, I was with Wise Technology for 10 years and iGel for two and a half years. So a lot of background in the thin client market and sort of the server-based computing space. Joining me also is Darren, so let him introduce himself. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Darren Hirons. Um, I work in the same team as Matt at VMware. I've been there for four years. Prior to that, I was uh, working in the NHS for quite a few years and some other public sector bodies. Okay, thanks. And um, as you said there, in the same team as me, it's probably one thing we, we overlook there, but we both work in the uh, EUC, so the End User Compute Team, um, in the pre-sales SE roles. So in terms of contents, um, we just have a quick look at what this project actually is and what it is we've done, and then sort of some of the rules, some of the vendors that we included in our testing, and a bit of background around the, the testing that we did, uh, and then some sort of results and a kind of a, a summary of those. So in terms of the project, um, you know, this was for us to look at the desktop repurposing, um, you know, options out there. So what we mean by that is where people have got existing maybe PCs, laptops, or even different thin clients, and they want to repurpose them to act as a thin client. So in that market space, you've got a lot of vendors, um, typically quite, or quite often I'd say they're sort of Linux-based operating systems. There are some Windows-based solutions out there, as well as Chrome. And what we wanted to do was look at those different offerings, how they performed against a VMware Workspace ONE and VMware Horizon environment. So what sort of performance we would see with VDI sessions as well as Workspace ONE taking advantage of SaaS and web applications. All in all, um, the project probably taken us a good nine months or so. Um, for some of the reason for some of that was waiting for code from vendors. Um, you know, Darren and I being able to get together to spend some time on it but then sort of re-releases of code with later versions of the Horizon client in it and things like that. The um, results that we've um, pulled from it or gained from it have been presented at a number of VMUGs, but we wanted to record, um, you know, a session and that, you know, we could share with a sort of slightly wider audience. So in terms of some of the rules, um, whenever we tested, it was always the same conditions. And what I mean by that is that we had two laptop devices, and we always connected back to test drive, which is VMware's um, test platform. The devices were always running the latest production code from the vendors. So if we had a bug or a problem, we would speak to the vendors about it, but if there was beta code or alpha code that fixed that, that wouldn't be part of the testing. We'd only test that when that became released, which is why we originally did a first round of testing in April, and then subsequent testing in sort of September, October time, and that would have been with later code that either fixed the bug or introduced a later VMware Horizon client. We also used out of the box configuration. So if the protocol worked really well, great. If it didn't work so well, if there was ways to improve it by making tweaks or changing files, that wasn't something we wanted to do. We wanted to look at what it was like out of the box. The endpoint hardware was always the same. As I mentioned at the very start there, we've got two identical laptops that we use for the testing. And the endpoint's always plugged in. Now, the reason I mention that is sometimes you find with laptops, if they're not plugged in, you know, you, you, you do find that um, to save battery power, perhaps the, you know, the CPU's clocked down a bit. So what we wanted to make sure was that performance wasn't affected by devices not being plugged in. Um, we always had a wired uh, LAN connection as well. It wasn't over wireless. So again, it's probably worth mentioning. So in terms of the vendors, I don't know if you want to cover this one off, Darren. Yeah, okay, Matt. So we tested a variety of vendors. Some were Linux based, some were Windows based, um, and um, we had one in particular, Neverware, which was um, Chrome based. Um, we didn't test all the vendors out on the market, but we tested a, a good selection of each, um, which gave us a representative um, sort of figures at the end. Okay, excellent. One thing that we probably should have said, or probably I should have said during the intro, was that also our goal for this was never really to be kind of like a smackdown where we said you know this solution is the best it was more about seeing what was out there and understanding the options and getting a good fit as to which vendors you know fit in the best solution and obviously with that different underlying os linux windows and chrome sometimes that could have been the driving factor 
you know, if a customer wanted a Windows based OS because they had requirements for that underlying OS, as well as repurposing it to be ThinkLine esque for delivery of virtual apps and SaaS apps and those sort of things, then that the information and the data we gather w- would help with that. And I think that's probably one thing that we were quite conscious of. We were never really looking at this, as I say, as that kind of competition, were we? It was more, we just wanted to understand what was out there and how they performed in general. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in, in terms of the sort of tests we did, um, you know, if you're familiar with Horizon, um, you know, there's support for um, three protocols, really RDP, P over IP and Blast. RDP is used by very few customers. It tends to be more Blast, P over IP. Um, we see a lot of use and a lot more people uptaking our Blast protocol. Um, but, you know, across all the platforms, I appreciate there's still a lot of people out there using P over IP. Therefore, we tested both um, where it was applicable. We looked at performance of, um, you know, sort of virtual GPU based machines. So we used sort of some of those NVIDIA, um, you know, demo, demo, uh, not videos, but, you know, de- demo programs, which, for, you know, looking at the slide, you're probably familiar with some of those. Um, as well as YouTube, as well as Windows Media Player or VLC to see how, um, you know, WMV files and AVA files play back. We went uh, into Workspace ONE using the local browser on the machines and launched SaaS apps like Office 365 and Salesforce, as well as web apps and Horizon applications as well. So we took a kind of real blended approach to not just pure VDI, but also more of a, you know, a Workspace type solution. In terms of the test devices, do you want to talk about those, Darren? Sure, yeah. So we used um, a, a Dell Latitude E7470. Um, as you can see on the screen, the spec was a, an i5 CPU running at 2.4 gigahertz. The laptop had 16 gig of RAM. Uh, it was using um, an Intel um, graphics uh, GPU. Um, the network even though it had wireless, we were using the um, Ethernet cable, don't forget, to guarantee the bandwidth. Um, and, and as Matt pointed out before, we had those all connected directly to the power. We weren't running them off battery, just in case anything was throttled during that performance testing. Um, we actually used a, a, a couple of these devices, so we, um, we were only ever testing on the same type of device. In, in terms of the server, um, as I said, we used test drive. So at the time, it was based on Horizon 7.4. When we did our second round of testing in September, um, from memory, it's probably up to 7.5, 7.6 Horizon. Um, in terms of the virtual, uh, sorry, in terms of the virtual machines that were there, you know, Windows 10 with uh, vGPU. I won't read out the specs, but you've got the server details there. And then we also accessed other machines as part of the testing. So Windows 10 without GPU, Windows 7 and remote desktop session host which is based on server 2016 but you can see the different server specs there in terms of the tools um you know pretty straightforward we we purchased um you know just a consumer grade um you know wattage reader just so we could see how much um you know energy and how much electricity was being pulled by the different devices so we did question whether it would always be the same because it was always the same hardware, but the results kind of proved otherwise. So there, there is a point to play and a part to play by the operating system that's sitting on the hardware. We use a stopwatch on an iPhone just to time things like how long it took to re-image from um, you know, the Windows operating system on the laptop to the particular vendor's operating system. And we had a whole stack of um, USB keys because quite often we used USB keys as our mechanism to repurpose and re-image the device. In terms of the case study, we thought that um, it would be good to add a bit of context around it and kind of have something to to steer the results at. So we created a hypothetical company that said they've got 5,000 employees running PCs um, that have a mixture of Windows 7 and Windows 10 on them. And they're in the process of modernizing. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna convert all those to um, you know, thin client style devices. So using a desktop repurposing tool, and then they're going to use them to access Workspace ONE and VMware Horizon. So we kind of use that as our framework so that at the end, when we can start to gain some insight as to 
what the costing would look like, we've kind of got something to apply that to. So we'll come back to this at the end. Okay, so in terms of the overview, we'll kick that off. So in terms of protocols, I mentioned that we use both BLAST and PCI over IP. Um, you know, generally we found that uh, BLAST was a little bit slicker. So you can see there that, that on the left-hand side is BLAST, on the right-hand side is PCI over IP. Again, two identical machines, um, both connecting back to the same hosts in our test drive platform. But you can see that PCI over IP is still very good, but maybe not quite as smooth as BLAST on the left-hand side there. Darren, do you want to talk about the re-imaging process? Yeah, sure. So just to give you an idea of what the re-imaging process what it actually looked like, uh, we've taken a short video of um, the AirTrust Thin Client install, and um, it's, uh, it's speeded up. I think it took about four minutes, but we've speeded it up into under a minute. The idea being just to give you an idea what the actual process looks like. Um, you essentially boot off the USB with most of these um, vendors and it repurposes the machine by reinstalling the OS over the existing Windows install. Um, once it's finished, as you can see, you literally click finish and it boots up. Um, most of the vendors at this point then try to, you know, try to pick up a DHCP address, as you can see on the screen now, and then they'll try and connect to a management server if one's available. In some cases, they would just come up and work. In some cases, they wouldn't work unless the management server was contactable. So as you said, you know, we, we did use USB just because that saved us some time in terms of prerequisites. We didn't need to set up management servers in every case and we you know, didn't need to set up Pixie servers. But you know, this table just sort of shows the different options across the different vendors. So we've got the vendors on the left-hand side, um, you know, USB you know, pretty much in all way or another is supported in all of them, apart from Dell and ThinScale purely because you install that software on top of a Windows OS. So the assumption there is obviously the Windows operating system is already there. Um, a couple of the vendors can support Pixie Boot. So Neverware as an example would support the Windows deployment server that would use Pixie. Um, IGEL and a few of the other vendors there can support other Pixie based products as well. Um, you know, there are also options around some PCLM tools uh, as an example like SCCM, you know, given if you look at the Dell option there, that's an MSI you could use a uh, piece of them to push that out just because it's an MSI. But you can see there that, you know, it's pretty standard to be USB and then on top of that, there are a few other options. I think where you, where you would probably stray away from USB, Matt, is where you have got a large, uh, you know, a large number of devices to update. Clearly USB is not going to be that good in that circumstances. There'd be too much effort involved. That's why you'd look at more of the PCLM tools or the Pixie boot options. Yeah, good, good point. I mean, for the for our testing, it made a lot of sense. But yeah, for for a five thousand user estate, then yeah, you don't want to be doing USB. Um. Okay, so I'll I'll pass over to Darren to start um, as vendor, and then we'll alternate the vendors between us. Um, but just before we do that, just uh, as I mentioned, this wasn't really a clear winner type scenario, so these aren't in any particular order. Um, so we put them in alphabetical order, basically, just so that we're not um, leading with particular vendors over others. So just to simplify that, we've put all the vendors in alphabetical order. Yep. Okay. So the first one up is Tenzig. Um, the code dates that were used were the latest that was available at the point of testing. Um, uh, and so the requirements do differ between the different different vendors. Um, these were the hardware requirements for Tenzig. Um, the actual time for USB uh, device re-imaging was just over three minutes, as you can see. The boot time was around about a minute, which is pretty good. Um, one thing we liked about the Tenzig um, option was that it came with two different browsers, uh, uh, Firefox and Chrome, which is quite useful. And another good thing was that the version of the Horizon client was the current version at the time. As, you, as we go through this, you'll find that some of them were running older versions of the Horizon client. Um, this was running the latest version at the time, which is good. Um, it supported all three of the protocols, Blast, PC over IP, and RDP. And it was quite good. I mean, this will make more sense as we go through the, the different options, uh, different vendors. But as you'll see as we go through it, this power consumption was quite low in comparison to some of the others. 
Um, when the device was idle, it was using 11.6 watts. And when it was running Workspace ONE, running Horizon and Office 365, for example, it was only consuming 18 watts on average. Um, the cost for the Tenzig option is £50 per license. That includes years support and maintenance. And then each subsequent year after that is an additional £13. Um, the management tool is called Tenzig Manager, which is included in the subscription. Um, and it's worth mentioning as well that there's currently no option to manage these with Workspace ONE. So um, you'd have to use the Tenzig Manager to be able to manage the, the endpoints. So the Tenzig, Tenzig Manager um, is included with the support and maintenance, as I said. Um, it uses a MySQL database, which is quite good. It doesn't actually uh, you know, require a full SQL license or anything. Um, it's a web management console, so there's no, there's no um, client involved that you need to install. It's just using the web browser. Um, and it comes with a, a host of other features, including like you know, um, client configuration. Um, you can schedule updates of the endpoints. You can do remote shadowing of the endpoints if that's something that you need to do. And um, you can do, um, you know, reset any of the devices back to the factory default at any point. Um, it's just a case with most of these management tools of putting them in groups and assigning configuration to those groups. And then they, when they report back, they pick up that configuration. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. We're just going to call out a few of the options on each page. We're not going to read them all out as we go through. So here is a video clip of the uh, Tenzig in action. For some reason, this video clip came out a little bit worse quality than the others, but uh, bear with it. Um, I think you get an idea of what the actual uh, performance is like in terms of the protocol, though, which is the important thing. You can see that this was running Blast in this particular instance, and the performance is pretty good on both the uh, Aquarium video in the bottom right and the um, Fairy video in the left, top left. Um, yeah, we were pretty impressed with the um, Tenzig performance. Okay, so then next up was Atrust. Um, again, we were able to test that a little bit more recently because there was a firmware update which included the latest Horizon client. Again, very similar. Um, you know, it has the three protocols. The difference of this code is that, you know, Firefox was the option. Um, we didn't have Chrome there, um, which isn't a massive issue, but it's just one of those sort of observations that we picked up on. Um, boot time is very quick, 27 seconds, imaging time just over four minutes. Um, and again, power consumption was pretty low. And again, from a price point of view, um, you know, very, very low cost solution in as much as £45 for the device. And that included support and maintenance. Um, like Tenzig, they also have a management tool, which was included in the price. Um, you know, again, you know, not taking anything away from any of the vendors, but the management tools are all relatively similar. You know, there's a, there's a core set of features that they will tend to do. Um, you know, as, as Darren sort of alluded to, quite often it's the, you know, the best use cases, you, you can create groups of those devices and then assign configs to them and then use the management tool to make sure that the firmware is updated, they're running the latest config, you know, full remote power management, wake on land, those sort of things, so that you can do those updates out of hours. Um, as well as in this product, you know, asset management, so you can get a good inventory of the devices in your estate, as well as, um, you know, help desk messaging, as well as logging. So that if we need to pull any reports or log files, you have that capability. In terms of the performance, again, we were looking at um, Blast, and this is the New Dawn video. So this is the one you saw in the previous video in the top left, which as you, hopefully you're seeing from the uh, recording, the quality of these are a lot better. But you can see generally, you know, very slick transition when the screens change the movement. This is, this is what you'd expect. And this is kind of what you, you typically see when connecting to an NVIDIA powered desktop. Next up, we've got the Dell PC conversion tool. So this is one of the tools which is actually repurposing the Windows machine. So it's just putting um, the Dell software on top of Windows and locking it down. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, a slightly older release, came out in April. Um, the hardware requirements there are Windows, serve, uh, Windows 7 SP1 or 64-bit Windows 10. Um, the firmware version that we tested was the first release, um, and we tested it with a Windows 10 17 or 9. Imaging time was quite slow. It took 20 minutes, which was 
a lot slower than the sort of Linux equivalent uh, repurposing tools. Um, boot time was quite quick though, just 32 seconds, which is probably, you know, it's probably about the same as booting Windows 10, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> the browser version was dependent on what the underlying Windows had installed when you repurposed it. So if the, if the Windows machine only had Edge installed, for example, or Internet Explorer, then that is what the converted version would have as well. Um, the Horizon client version in the Dell conversion tool was quite an old version. It was running 4.3. As I mentioned before, 4.8 was the latest at the time. So um, this was a particularly old version. I think the oldest of all the ones we tested. Um, but I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I believe that this could be manually updated before the actual conversion took place and it would, would replace the version that was um, in the conversion tool. Yeah, so if you if you installed, say, for the 4.8 um, client, then when you installed the conversion kit, it would detect there's a client there and would leave it alone. So there's, yeah. just, well, there's just one built into the installer just in case you haven't got one at all. Yeah, so our advice with this tool, uh, it, unless it's changed since you watched this video, is that you should upgrade the uh, install a newer version of the client before you do the conversion. Um, the tool itself, you supported all three protocols. So whether you want to use Blast, PC over AP or RDP, it is, uh, all options are available. Power consumption was pretty good. We got just 11 watts uh, when it was idle and 13 watts using the Edge browser to use again Workspace ONE and Horizon simultaneously. Um, the cost was £59 per year per device. So that's, um, and that included the WISE management suite, which is what you need to actually do the management of the endpoints. Um, or you could use SCCM to, to manage those as well. Um, so it wasn't manage, manageable by Workspace ONE, um, although potentially the uh, you could probably do something with it if you disabled the right filter, but we never tested that. So uh, uh, we'd have to go with uh, an option of no for this, as, as it being managed, manageable by Workspace ONE. Yeah, one, one thing to probably move on to the slides there, um, to be fair to Dell, there is just about to be launched or has just been launched a version two. Um, but, you know, imaging times, boot times, those sort of things are very similar. It does include a later Horizon client from memory, it's possibly four or five. So again, I guess when they go into development cycles, it's based on what's the current release at that time. So if, obviously if we release one in the meantime, it's not the latest. So absolutely right, best practice would be to, to make sure you're running the latest client and then install this on top and then it preserve that anyway. So that's the way forward. Thanks, Matt. So the, yeah, as I mentioned, the WISE management suites, the management um, side of this, uh, it's included in the cost. Um, it's cloud-based rather than being on-prem, so which is quite nice because it allows you to, you know, connect to it from, from any device. I think there's even a, a mobile client to connect to it as well. Um, the standard version supports up to 10,000 devices um, and you can rebrand the portal, etc. you know, with your own company's branding. Um, yeah, that's about it really. Next one, Matt. So this was using the BLAST protocol on the Dell Wise converter tool. Uh, you can see the quality of this is pretty good. This is the first one that we've shown you that's using the BLAST protocol. Um, Yeah, not too bad. Okay, on to iGel. Um, so again, that's sort of a, a test from the original run back in April. Um, I believe that since we tested, there has been a firmware update. And I think when we went to do the second round of testing, the Horizon client was still based on 4.6, which is why we didn't retest. Um, boot time, pretty quick. Conversion time, pretty quick. So you know, generally impressed with the iGel offering. Um, from a browser point of view, includes Firefox, um, power consumption, similar, um, if not a little bit on the low side compared to some of them. Um, from a costing point of view, um, you know, price is a little bit higher than some of the other offerings out there, but, you know, I would say it's a, a very um, sort of solid and, and feature rich operating system. Um, and there are obviously options around the different maintenance, whether you want that with one, two or three years maintenance. The management tool um, is also included in that price. 
So I think that that probably maybe compensates why it's at a certain price point. But the um, the, the management software there's called uh, Universal Management Suite. So if we take a look at some of the features of that, um, some particularly nice features around um, things you can do around DHCP and DNS for sort of auto registration. So you can start to populate the database as devices are sort of unboxed and fouled up or you know converted from existing machines. Um, again, you can sort of create those groups so you can apply um, you know configurations to, to devices. But there is also an option called, uh, I think it's called Shared Workplace, which allows you to um, apply a config to a device based on the user. So if you've got users that roam across different devices and hot desk, if they've got a specific config, that can roam with them, which is quite a nice feature. Again, some of the similar other features around power management, wake on LAN, job scheduling, those sort of things. From a report point of view, uh, sorry, so from a support point of view, the ability to run VNC um, and sort of carry out some remote actions. So I'd say, you know, of, of the management tools, I think it's probably got stuff in there that maybe some of the other vendors don't. It's maybe a little bit more feature rich. So I think it's probably quite, um, you know, quite a, quite a rich and strong offering. So from a performance point of view, this is Windows Media Player, uh, again, running Blast. So you can see that, again, playback's pretty smooth. Um, you know, this is a, uh, I think this was an MP4 video that we looked at. So, you know, again, plays back really well. Um, similarly, video playback in general was good, we found, you know, whether it be through YouTube or, or uh, Windows Media Player, always looked quite slick. So next up, we have Neverware, which is the um, Chrome offering. Um, so this is the only Chrome offering that we tested. Um, it dated from August 2018. Uh, imaging time was um, almost eight minutes, but it did some kind of convoluted um, unzipping process and then downloading of the package from the internet. So it took slightly longer um, than the seven minutes 46 uh, um, imaging time. Um, boot time was quick though, just 22 seconds, so it was fast. Um, it only contained one browser, which was Chromium. Um, which seemed to work okay. The Horizon client was the latest version, um, but that was installed by us from the uh, Google Play Store, which is accessible. Um, so that's, that, that worked fine. Um, only Blast protocol is supported. There was no PC over IP or RDP support. Uh, and as you can see, the power consumption when it was idle was 18 watts, and when it was running Workspace ONE and Horizon was 21 watts, so not too bad. Um, cost was £35 per device per year. Um, but then if you wanted to manage it, you had to use the uh, Google Admin Console, which you required the enterprise license for, which is an additional $50 um, per device. Now, Workspace ONE can manage um, Google devices, um, and we did test the um, Neverware offering, um, and it didn't seem to work. So I think currently we have to say that it's not manageable from Workspace ONE, but potentially it could be further down the line. It's just not on our kind of um, testing um, list right now. Um, but with enough you know, enough pressure from uh, from customers, we could probably um, see that added in the future. So as I mentioned, it uses the Google um, Enterprise uh, licenses, which is all managed from the cloud, the Google Admin Console. Um, it's pretty slick. Um, you can do usual um, sets of um, management options you can you can do includes the user settings um, which means users can roam between devices and settings will follow them um, you can do nice things like set up kiosk mode so you can make devices into kiosks you can control all the software update settings etc um, and you can do power scheduling a lot of these settings are common across all the different offerings but yeah it's pretty good Uh, so this one is showing, uh, obviously it's Blast because it's the only protocol that Neverware's got, but on the left we've got YouTube and on the right we've got the new Dawn video. As you can see, performance is pretty good on both. Um, yeah, it was um, pr pretty good um, performance on the uh, Chrome device. So next up we looked at uh, the offering from Prime. Um, one thing that's sort of... Um, just wanted to mention here is that when you look at the power consumption figures there isn't one for when we ran workspace one in conjunction with horizon 
And that's because there just seemed to be an issue that when we tried to launch the Horizon session from the browser, um, perhaps the file association wasn't correct or something, but it didn't work. Um, therefore, we weren't able to, to create the same conditions we did on the other platforms. Therefore, we couldn't get a fair reading. But that aside, in general, you know, Linux offering, um, you know, similar to some of the other offerings out there in terms of sort of functionality, what it offered, you know, latest Horizon client, the, the, the breadth of different protocols. In terms of boot time, it was a little slower than some of the others, so nearly um, up to two minutes. My suspicion is probably because that's because the admin software wasn't there. We found that some appeared to look like they were trying to check in or their agent was firing up and it was probably doing some sort of discovery looking for the admin console. Um, but as we didn't have one in place, that could probably sort of hinder that boot time a little bit. Um, in terms of cost, it was £66. And um, that sort of includes Thin Man, which is the management tool. Well, I say sort of, that's because there's two versions. So if we skip across to that, there's a um, premium and a platinum edition. So premium edition is free. So that's why I sort of said sort of, but for an additional cost, you can go to the platinum edition. Um, and that adds some additional functionality, some, uh, like an identity layer and some smart card management and a few other pieces. But in terms of um, the, the, the tool itself, quite nice in as much as it had an internal database. So if you had a small workspace or, you know, it was sort of a smaller environment, you could use that internal database. Um, there's also support for my SQL. So if you wanted to deploy on a larger scale, um, you have the options to do that. Similar features to the others, you know, auto discovery, wake on and power management, scheduling, software updates, and sort of reporting and event logging, those sort of things. In terms of performance, um, we did take a video of um, YouTube performance, which would just be using the Horizon client, um, you know, directly to, uh, you know, Horizon connection server and then launching a Windows 10 desktop. So you can see in terms of performance um, and blast, you know, was pretty good. Again, very similar to sort of the other Linux offerings out there. So it was just really that kind of one scenario we couldn't really capture, which was the Workspace ONE browser with Office 365 launched. Um, you know, other SaaS web applications, and then the Horizon connection. Next up is um, Stratadesk. Uh, their solution is called No Touch Desktop. Um, the uh, imaging time was uh, 2 minutes 55. Boot time was 38 seconds. Now, I forgot to mention, by the way, that this is a Linux-based solution. Um, it only contained one browser, which was the Firefox um, version. Um, and the Horizon client was the latest version at the time, 4.8. It supports both Blast and PC over IP. And power consumption was pretty good. 14.3 uh, watts idle and 17.6 running Workspace ONE and Horizon. Um, the cost is uh, just over £50, that includes a licence and a year's maintenance. Um, and the No Touch Centre, which is the management tool, is included in that cost. Um, currently, this is not manageable by uh, Workspace ONE. So the No Touch Centre is pretty similar to all the other management tools, to be honest. Uh, this one comes with a couple of additional features. One nice one is that it's supplied as an, uh, as an additional OVA which means you can just deploy it directly into your um, VMware estate, which is quite nice. Um, it uses a MySQL database if you use the OVA. Uh, the Windows installer, if you choose to go down that route, supports a variety of databases, MySQL, SQL, and Oracle. Um, there's some other nice touches, like you can set up automated emails, you can set up LDAP authentication methods to give people access to different parts of the um, management tool. Um, you can do the usual setting up groups, assigning config to groups, etc. Um, yeah, it was uh, it's, a, it's a pretty nice tool to use, to be honest, um, but very similar to a lot of the other ones. So this is the Stratadesk offering, uh, running PC over IP and running the Windows Media Player video that we've already seen on another offering. Um, as you can see, performance is pretty good. Definitely comparable with all the others. Okay, on to thin scale now. 
So this is one of the Windows based offerings. So this requires that you have uh, Windows 7 or above OS and this, and this sits on top of it. Where this differs to the Dell offering is that, um, I, I, I don't I suppose the Dell offering's kind of been built more as a thin client kind of um, operating system. And what I mean by that is it includes things like the right filter, which is very typical on a Windows based thin client. Whereas this this tool doesn't. This is just really a sort of a kiosky tool, if that makes more sense. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, we're looking at different products and, and different solutions and where they'd fit in different use cases. So again, I you know, I, I like the solution, it's very nice. You know, the installation was very quick and the boot time really reflected the boot time of the of the test laptop. So again, that was very quick. Like the Dell offering, you know, the browser version is based on that underlying OS. So if I installed or I had Edge and Chrome and Firefox, then I'm going to have them available to me in that kiosk mode. The Horizon client isn't included. So that's something that you would need to install. Um, but again, best practices would be to have the latest version installed. Um, by the Thin Kiosk management tool, you can configure it to deliver third party apps. So that would be a mechanism built in to be able to do that. The reason there's a hash or, or a dash there next to protocol support is just because the Horizon client isn't there. But obviously, if you install the latest Horizon client, you're going to have Blast, PCRIP, and RDP. In terms of power consumption, you know, very low, idling at 11 watts and consuming 17 when we're actually running the session. From a price point of view, there's an enterprise version and an enterprise plus. There's a, a um, you know a variant in price there, and that does include the Thin Kiosk uh, management console. Now, the reason I'm saying that it is supportable, Windows dependent with Workspace ONE, is that um, within Workspace ONE, we have support for Windows 10, you know, taking advantage of all the modern management APIs. So that's something I'll come back to and talk about. Um, and the re reason I say Windows dependent is because this supports Windows 7, whilst we have some support capabilities in Workspace ONE for Windows 7 OS, it's limited compared to that of Windows 10. If we look at the Thin Kiosk management tool, um, as I said, it's included in cost, local database built in, um, which is really sort of just recommended more for sort of POCs and, and, and small scale. But you can then install and integrate um, with SQL. Enterprise and Enterprise Plus are the two versions. Enterprise Plus includes additional management of Windows components, so like security, patching, the firewall. Um, if you were using this in conjunction with Workspace ONE, there would be a bit of overlap there. Um, which again, I'll touch on in the next slide. Um, you know, you have management here for the shell. So if you want the device to, to boot up into a single app, those sort of things, if you want to, um, yeah, I guess configure it more in that kiosk style mode, that's something that would be controlled here via the thing kiosk management tool. You can also have uh, like this Windows Security Center. So that will check for running components. So you can configure it so it's making sure things like Defender and the firewall are running on the endpoint. So there are a couple of nice features in there that, that uh, you know, make it quite a nice proposition for managing the Windows-based devices. From a Workspace ONE point of view, as I mentioned, you know, we can integrate um, and manage Windows 10 devices. So we can take advantage of knowledge management. So we could have those Windows devices enrolled into Workspace ONE UEM. There's a number of ways of doing the enrollment can be out of the box, can be using Azure AD credentials or uh, local AD credentials. We can use um, you know, autopilot as a way of enrollment. We have a mechanism with Dell, where Dell can ship hardware with the Workspace ONE agent pre-built in and do some factory provisioning. But above all, when it comes to that um, device management, you know, we can do full sort of uh, NDM profile management, but also manage Windows components like Edge and Defender and Firewall and have BitLocker management you can put compliancy rules in place so that users get certain permissions based on their compliancy. So if they're running certain knowledge base fixes or KB fixes from Microsoft, or if they're wanting particular versions of the OS, um, you can also do, you know, the full uh, WSUS management. So you can control the, the Windows updates to those different machines, whether they're on critical or, you know, long term or, or whatever ring it is they're on. In terms of performance, um, you know, very good because effectively, you know, what you're running there is is the full Windows client on top of Windows 10 in our case. So what we're looking at here is PCI over IP. So 
again, this is Red Bull TV, just, um, you know, a YouTube channel. And again, you can see there that the, um, you know, performance is very slick. Equally Blast was just as good. Um, but, you know, yeah, in general, kind of the, the performance we'd expect to see. Next up's Unicon and their product is called Elux. Um, uh, the imaging for this one took just over three minutes, which is pretty much standard in line with all the others. Um, boot time again, 31 seconds, not too bad. Uh, it came with Firefox and Chromium, which is sometimes uh, nice to have the choice of two browsers. Um, the Horizon client version was 4.701, which was not quite the latest version, but still not too bad. Um, and as a result, it supported Blast, PC over IP and RDP, which is, which is the full uh, range of protocols. Uh, power consumption was a little bit higher than some of the others, 27 watts when idle and 30 watts when in use. Um, the cost is an interesting one. So if you, if you run it in what's called unmanaged mode, it's free. So if, if you want to just use it for personal use, you can get it for free. Uh, the managed version, however, is £58 per year uh, and £19 for subsequent years. So it's, it's not too bad if you want to have a test with uh, one of these uh, solutions. Um, the management tool for this particular one is called Scout Enterprise, but that's included in the management costs. Again, currently, this is not manageable with Workspace ONE. So the Scout uh, management tool um, is included in the cost, as I said. It needs a Microsoft SQL Server, um, which you have to factor in the cost of uh, into the solution. Um, but again, it provides a lot of the features that the others do, uh, you know, around profile installs and shadowing capabilities, uh, work on LAN, et cetera, and managing updates. Um, it's got some dashboarding and reporting features as well, which is quite nice. So one thing I would mention on this tool, which I think was a slight differentiator to some of the others, was that seems to recall they had a quite a nice feature where at the boot time of a device, it could check for firmware updates. And if the user was notified there was a firmware update, it could also allow them to defer the update. So obviously if they were urgently just trying to connect to do something and they didn't want to do the update then and there, they could. I think that was just one of the kind of like the little features that maybe differentiated a bit from some of the other offerings. So for this one, we've chosen to display um, the Unicon offering running PC over AP and Blast side by side. So you get a good idea of, uh, you know, the differences between the two protocols on the same device. Um, as you can see, both are pretty good. With a lot of these things, I think it comes down to, you know, personal preference. What one person thinks is better isn't necessarily what another person would agree with, but um, I'm sure you'll all make up your own minds as to which one you think was best. Okay, so um, almost at the end here, and we're just looking at VXL now. So again, it was one of the ones we tested back in April, and when we did the second round of testing, didn't because there wasn't uh, an update which brought a newer Horizon client. Um, but again, you know, in, in terms of general performance as a Linux offering, similar, you know, nice features in as much as it offers the Firefox and Chrome browsers, which as Darren sort of um, commented on the previous that it's quite a nice option to have both available um, you're not sort of forced down a certain route then of a particular browser um, imaging took a little bit um, longer than some of the others and boot time was 41 which is you know I guess sort of fairly similar to, to some of the other devices out there um, I also have a feeling that when we did the testing here that there also was an element of it looking for that management server so a possible delay during that boot Power consumption, strangely, and we tested it multiple times, was, was higher when it was idling to when we were actually doing something. And that's something that we checked on a couple of occasions, but it always seemed to draw the same result. So that was a little bit unusual. But at the end of the day, you know, the plug we used costs, you know, 20 pounds from Amazon. So it's not really a, an industry grade or um, something that somebody would use for like, I guess, real um, you know, testing for documented testing. But Obviously, it served our purposes, but that was just a, a kind of a bit of a quirk that came out here. Um, there's a cost involved with both the operating system and the management software. But when you put those two prices together, again, similar price point to some of those other offerings out there. So in terms of the uh, LTM or you know, Lenovo Terminal Management, um, internal MySQL, 
you know, externally you can use Postgres or MySQL. So certainly recommended for those larger implementations. Similar functionality in terms of auto discovery and device registration, you know, automatic device configuration, um, inventory of software and hardware, you know, alerting, task logging, and um, you know, the ability to remotely um, shut down the devices, reboot them, and do power management and, and shadowing them. So again, um, we've probably said it a, a number of times, but the Linux management products all tend to be relatively similar. There are some differences and some subtle differences. Some have got some little features that are really nice, but in general, uh, as a whole, they're re relatively similar. So in terms of sort of the performance that we saw, here we're using Blast again um, and looking at the NVIDIA Faceworks um, sort of demo program. So again, you can see, you know, connecting to Windows 10 desk with an NVIDIA card in it, you know, very slick, kind of the sort of user experience I'd expect to see. And one thing I, I can't remember if I actually mentioned at the start, it was um, that little while ago, but you know, the, the test drive platform we tested on is actually, um, all our testing was done in the UK on that platform itself is based in Amsterdam. So, you know, there was always a little bit of latency on the line. We didn't always check it, but I would have thought it was probably around 30, 40 milliseconds of latency. So in general, <clears throat> everything performed really well given the network conditions. Okay. So the final point. Yeah, so the last one we decided to test out the, it was quite a relatively new offering at the time, but Stratadesk, we've already mentioned, uh, released a release for Raspberry Pi. So um, yeah, we tested this um, in December um, using the latest code release at the time. Imaging time and boot times are both really quick. Imaging 45 seconds to image the uh, micro SD card. Uh, boot time just over 20 seconds. Um, it comes with two browsers, uh, Firefox and Chromium. The Horizon client was 4.9. I mean, it was admittedly the code release was only December, so it was it was a later release than all the others. However, 4.9 had only recently come out, so it was pretty up to date. Um, it supports Blast PC over IP and RDP, and the power consumption. Uh, we had to test multiple times because we didn't kind of um, realize it was going to be so low, but um, 3.5 watts when idle and 3.8 watts when in use, so really low power consumption. But I guess we should have expected that from a Raspberry Pi. Um, so you can actually use the actual basic features for free. Um, so you can set up a connection to Horizon, for example, and you can um, set up a connection to a web browser and you can use those for free. It's only if you want the no touch center for management that there's a, there's a cost involved and, and, and that cost would be uh, similar to what it was for the other types of devices, I would guess. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to set this up just to test, then it's, it's free of charge to test it with. Um, I also did some testing around, you know, integrating it with other things as well, such as um, uh, Improvite, Tap and Go, uh, using smart cards, and it all worked exactly the same as it would with any other kind of repurposing solution. So despite it being a Raspberry Pi, it's still a very, very usable solution. It's got a, a whole uh, host of features included. Um, currently not manageable with Workspace One, though, uh, much like a lot of the other ones. Okay. So in, in terms of the summary, and I hope that's given you um, all a sort of good bit of, of uh, I guess, overview of, of the different solutions out there. As Darren said, like Raspberry Pi was a relatively late addition. We hadn't really ever planned to test it because obviously the hardware is different to what we were testing. So when we look at the results, Raspberry Pi isn't included in those results because it would skew the results and that would be a little unfair on the vendors. So if we just refer back to that sort of case study, and as I said, what we kind of, Put together was kind of um you know kind of fake company that's got five thousand users windows 7 windows 10 and they want to modernize and they're going to move everybody over to this kind of thin style uh thin client style os and then access workspace one and horizon so if we look at sort of the summary um and i'll properly explain and, and add a bit of this everything was done using rrps so these prices aren't necessarily what prices you may see or may get or get quotes on. This is just what was available to us at the time. And that time was April or September. So again, prices could have changed. So there's a, you know, a real caveat around um, those things here. So 
if we looked at say the windows column what we did is we took the price for the dell solution the price for the thin scale solution put them together and divided it by two because there's two vendors doing that and that's where we come up with the average cost because the management cost is zero is it means it's either included or you need to use a third party to do it therefore it's zero so in some cases the management cost isn't really zero but for the purposes of the illustration it needs to be because there wasn't a you know a physical associated cost with that that makes sense um so again that's why the linux management cost is quite low because only certain vendors charged so that when you divided that figure by the six or seven linux vendors we tested that obviously makes that average cost very low because it's it's going against people that don't charge so with that in mind if you look at that top line average cost of the os so if you buy windows based solutions roughly 53 pounds linux based roughly 47 chrome roughly 35 average management cost for windows is zero for linux is 12 pounds for chrome is 35. so the total cost for windows is 53 Linux is 59 and then Chrome is 70 and then the average uh, imaging time again bear in mind a lot of these are going to be skewed by certain vendors so don't necessarily think that it means that a particular operating system is slower than others it could just be a particular vendor that's kind of skewing that number but the average imaging time is 11 minutes for Windows and just over three for Linux and just over nine for Chrome boot time 30 for Windows, 46 for Linux, and 22 for Chrome. And then you've got the average um, kilowatt then. So when we did our figures on the slides, it all looked at the um, power consumption based on the watt. But here is, is based on device per month. So we've gone for a kilowatts. So, you know, Windows is 5.45, Linux 10.19, and Chrome 8.91. And that's just when you're idle. Obviously, a lot of the management tools allow you to shut down devices. And then do a wake on LAN. So those idle costs may not exist if you do that, but it's just making you aware that they could. So then average power consumption when you're working, and that's based on a seven and a half hour day, is 3.38, uh, 4.48, and 4.73. And then in terms of costs, what it means for the device cost when idling versus when working per device per month. Okay, so that makes sense. So then if you look at the cost of the licenses for 5,000 users, you've got 260, well, nearly 269,000 for Windows, nearly 240,000 for Linux, and 175,000 for Chrome. And then power consumption <clears throat> for 5,000 devices when they're working is 2,500 for Windows, just over 3,000 or 3,000, uh, nearly 3,400 for Linux and 3,500 for Chrome. So you can see that, um, you know, they're not all hugely different. And as I said, there are vendor numbers in there that will skew the figures a little bit um, and, and obviously change that dynamic um, and, and affect the other results. But, you know, the reason for doing this was to help sort of, I guess, to sort of put a bit of a cost or a value against all that testing we did and, and help you kind of understand and see um what these solutions can look like so in, in summary um you know it, there's a lot out there there's lots of different solutions out there it's really about finding um which solution is is the best fit for your use case you know at vmware we're very lucky we have a very rich ecosystem we're in a very good position <clears throat> so as i said it's really just about finding which um, solution is the best fit for your use case and, and matching with that. So thank you all for your time um, from both myself and Darren and I hope you found this uh, presentation useful. Thanks.